Clients are looking for trusted advice and a sense of stability as they navigate the new normal. And by using Bill.com, accounting firms can free up more time for valuable strategic advisory services by helping clients shift their accounts payable process online. Stay tuned to hear more from our sponsor, Bill.com, later in the episode. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by JustWorks. JustWorks is a combination of simple software and expert support. With JustWorks, your clients get automated payroll, access to affordable benefits, HR tools, and employee regulation compliance, all in one place. Should you, your clients, or their employees ever have any questions about benefits or payroll, you can just call JustWorks. The -the round-the-clock support team is standing by with dedicated support just for accountants. JustWorks is simple and fast. It has an easy-to-use dashboard, integrations with QuickBooks and Xero, and additional automated tools to serve the modern workforce. Ready to give JustWorks a try? For a limited time, Cloud Accounting Podcast listeners can get two free months of JustWorks service. Head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash JustWorks. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash J-U-S-T-W-O-R-K-S. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Giraffe. Giraffe sounds a lot like giraffe, and that's no accident. Giraffes are the tallest animal in the world. That gives them a great view. Our goal at Giraffe is to give you a similarly great view of what's going on with your business. We do that by helping you understand where your business has been, and most importantly, predict where it's going. Giraffe connects your cloud-based accounting, payroll, CRM, and billing data together to automatically update shareable online dashboards, monthly reporting packages, and sophisticated financial plans and budgets in real time. Learn how accounting firms are using Giraffe to deliver connected insight, strategize growth, and help their clients make more profitable decisions. Visit giraffe.com and start your 30-day free trial. That's J-I-R-A-V.com. See farther with Giraffe. Welcome to the Cloud Accounting Podcast. I'm Blake Oliver. I'm David Leary. So how, how are things in Tucson, David? Is it uh, calm? Crazy? It's relatively calm. I'm not close to downtown. I know that there was some protest last night. Um, I know you're staying with your parents in Phoenix, a little closer to downtown Phoenix. Yeah. Which I saw there's... Or, I mean, are you hearing things? Are you seeing things? Are, you know... So, so I, I didn't even know anything was happening in Phoenix until I turned on YouTube. Because my parents are... Uh, cord cutters, which is kind of amazing considering they're in their late 60s and 70s. They ditched cable. And so I don't don't get the local news unless I'm on um, YouTube. So I saw, oh, there's protests downtown near the uh, police headquarters. And then uh, that was, I guess, last night or the night before last. And then yesterday, I went to the mall, which is open here in uh, Scottsdale. I was getting like a Play-Doh set for my son. And I was kind of surprised that how many people were, were not even trying to social distance? There, There's a giant line of people waiting to get into the Louis Vuitton store. And I'm just thinking to myself, wow, this is really unnecessary. <laughs> You're not even like really going out anyway. Do you really need more Louis Vuitton stuff? I don't think I'll be going back there. But then last night, I, I was you know uh, watching the news and that mall was getting looted. They like looted the Apple store. They looted uh, urban outfitters. You know, I, I, I don't know who these um, looters were. But, you know who it is? It's that jackass from YouTube, that uh, Logan Paul guy, who like that guy is trying to videotape and pump up his YouTube channel. So he just shows up. This is this is a he's worth like seventeen million dollars. He's a white guy from Scottsdale. Uh-huh. Went and looted the mall and documented. Oh, it. so that's the guy they were talking about on Twitter. Wow. Yeah. So, so like obviously, there's a ton of racial issues here that are really important that need to be addressed, and that is legitimate police brutality, all this stuff. But then I feel like there is an element of this where it's just people that want to go out and loot. Because there was a protest at downtown in in Phoenix, which I think that was like the legit protest. And then there were just these people looting the mall in Scottsdale. And Yeah, and and I think that's a a good example of that because the march to go from downtown Phoenix to that mall in Scottsdale in a 100-degree heat at 10 p.m. at night, probably it's not the protest marching to the mall. No, it wasn't right. protesters. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was so, just people taking advantage of the situation. I mean, I don't know. I wasn't there, but that's what it feels like. But, like, I mean, why would you be looting urban outfitters if you're trying to protest? Yeah. Like, and <laughs> it's, it, things are messy. The country's in pain. And uh, I, I actually was walking the dog this morning. I was like, how do we even do a show today? Right. And I was just like thinking, you know, at some level, like 
it's important that we do the show, right? Like when the country's right. in chaos, like we need to be watching. Um, account. And I saw somebody on Twitter just like, you know, COVID vanished, PPP has vanished, right? And like when the country's in chaos, like this is when the IRS, the SBA government passes laws and they pass bills and they do things that nobody notices. And, you know, at some other level, I like step back and think about like tax policy in this country dictates social policy. And so like accounts and bookkeepers, what's happening right now we have says in, we influence, we're going to feel the effects of this. Even at the level, there probably be some bill in the, to a protest riot damage bill or something in small businesses, so which will have tax implications. So I, this is going to affect all of us and, and to not mm. do the show doesn't make a lot of sense. Well, and I think that you know, the media is portraying this as about one thing, which is police brutality in a specific instance with Floyd. I wonder how much of the protests and the the anger is not just that, but also the the whole situation right now, being in lockdown for months, the economic impact of losing your job, which has overwhelmingly hit minority communities and and uh, you know disadvantaged communities. Uh, and, and that all ties together, right? It's not just one thing. It's this whole situation that's been brewing for months and months and years. And it, yeah, it's it's a tinderbox, right? That that's gone yeah. off because I mean, maybe that isn't the best word, but it's just this pressure's been there. And then on top of that, you lop in the fact that the pandemic and COVID is affecting minorities more. Yeah. Like it's just right. it, it's like the perfect storm to where like something was probably going to happen anyways. Like you could just you could start feeling it in the air, right? That's I don't know. It's it's hard yeah. to fully digest. It, it, um, and, it's really and I've seen even on the, some of the Facebook groups, like even accountants are being a little snotty to each other. Like the people are trying to have discussions about this, and people are definitely forging their lines in the sand of what side of this they fall on. Yeah. Well, to me, the crazy thing was, you know, since we're in the cloud here, Twitter putting warnings on Trump's tweets and then flat out, you know, blocking one from view. You had to click through to see it uh, for glorifying violence. Like that is. That is amazing that that happened. You know, people have been criticizing the social media companies for years for not doing this. Now Twitter does it. They take a stand. They do it. And then Mark Zuckerberg says, no, Facebook is not going to do that. And it's like this showdown now with, uh, with Trump and the executive order, you know, that's not actually going to do anything because he doesn't have the power to do it. But yeah, it's, it's nuts right now. Um, I, I, somebody was comparing this to, you know, uh, the summer of 1968 or something. Yeah. The election uh, year maybe. leading up to the conventions. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, um, anyway, w there, there was some good news related to COVID-19, uh, the pandemic, uh, in terms of the government response, which is that the house passed a bill to address some of the issues with the paycheck protection program. This was as reported in the wall street journal. It's a bipartisan bill that passed, 417 to 1 on Thursday. And the bill, which still has to get passed by the Senate and signed by the president, would reduce the level of the funds that have to be used on payroll from 75% to 60% and would also give borrowers up to 24 weeks to use the funds up from the eight set in the initial bill passed in March and extends the deadline to rehire workers to December 31st. I am starting to firmly believe that the march towards just rubber stamping all PPP forgiveness is going to happen. Like th th it'll be this bill this week, and we'll probably see another bill two weeks from now. It's the only thing that makes sense, right? Is what they're doing is they're just wasting small businesses' time every time they change this. They're wasting accounts and bookkeepers' time, and now there's a whole different crisis on the table, right? Where are they going to really pay any attention to PPP now? And they're going to have to just get this off their plate. And the only way to do that is yeah. to just, if you're under 2 million, we assume that the banks vetted you out, they're going to rubber stamp it. I truly believe that's going to happen. I, I, I don't have any proof. I just, I think it's just a march. We're just marching yeah. towards it, towards it, it, towards it. I think that's going to happen simply because of the lack of resources to process approval applications. Like there's just no way that the SBA is going to do this. And they're not really requiring the banks to do it. So like they just don't have the manpower to audit even a tiny fraction. So maybe that's all they'll do is do a tiny fraction. The rest will all just get automatically approved or they'll approve them conditionally and then reserve the right to go back and audit years later. Maybe they'll do it then because you're supposed to save the paperwork for six years and they could theoretically come back and disallow it after the fact. I don't know. 
So it's a good thing. I think they should go further, though. You said this at the very beginning of all the stimulus. You brought up this uh, idea by economists that the best thing to do is just to give people money and attach very few strings to it. Yep. Like That was one of the lessons that we learned last time in the Great Recession. And even reducing the payroll requirement from 75% to 60% is not enough. It should just There should be no payroll requirement. This should just be money to small businesses. It should be small business stimulus. Don't attach these requirements to it. And the small businesses will figure out how to spend it. And yeah, some of them might not spend it the best way, but the whole point is to get money you know, out into the economy. And, and if you just attach strings to it, it's going to cause problems just like this. And that's the reason why there's still something like $100 billion of, of PPP money there that people aren't even taking advantage of because obviously it's too difficult to use it. Well, it's, it's not just uh, that. So there's an article in Bloomberg about um, businesses are returning the money. Yeah. Right? Yeah, because they can't, they can't spend it. So they, they're not going to get forgiveness for it. So they don't want the loan. $20 billion in PPP loans have been canceled. Some of it could be like people applied twice for two different channels. And so they canceled the application. They keep some of it's yeah. that. But ultimately, a lot of it is just because people are getting the money and they, they're, they either can't spend it. They don't know if they're going to be audited. They don't know if they're going to have – like they're already in debt. Like they, they struggled to get through April because of the economy. And now they're struggling to reopen. It's, it's, they're not in a great situation to reopen. And then the stress of this loan. And so they're kind of like, what, what's in my control? Well, I don't have to take this loan. And they're just being done with it. And, 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 and arguably, we don't know this for sure, but I'm going to bet that m almost all of that money, that 20 billion you said, is small businesses, private companies that really should be allowed to hold on to the money, that need the money, but are returning it because they can't meet these strings that are attached to it. And of the public companies that receive PPP loans, 80% of them are holding on to the money. They're going to keep it. That's according to an analysis by market research firm Fact Squared. Only 68 public companies have returned their PPP loans for a total of $435 million. So the public companies are able to take advantage of it, right? Because they can figure out how to jump through the hoops. Except for now the SEC is going to start investigating. Did you see this? No, I did not see that. So they're going to start investigating public companies that got the funds and they've already started to send out some letters about this. And really, if you read the article, the, the whole premise is, well, well, actually one part of the article that you talk about, um, the um, co-director of enforcement at a, Where was this? A Bloomberg. So this is in Bloomberg this week. And the co-director of enforcement at a some group meeting earlier this month, he said, Stephen Pikin, P-E-I-K-I-N, Stephen Pikin said that his division's already begun to focus time and resources on coronavirus-related misconduct. And, Ooh, wonderful. and the premise is, is that companies, if they took out this loan, because you're taking out the loan because why, Blake? You have an economic need, need right? So if yeah. they create, if they applied for this loan and got a loan, but did not disclose in the previous quarters any going concerns, they may have defrauded investors, et cetera. <sighs> so that, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> That doesn't make sense because it, to be a going concern, you have to, there has to be a question as to whether or not you'll be able to survive for the next 12 months. But the certification requirement in the PPP is way vaguer than that. Yeah. And then on top of that, I mean, how could you have disclosed in a previous quarter not knowing this pandemic was coming either? Um, yeah, exactly. That's ridiculous. What a waste, what a waste of resources. Uh, oh, you want to know another uh, government screw up in regard to this whole stimulus PPP thing? It's your, one of your favorite people, David, Betsy DeVos. This is the education. The education secretary who is <laughs> okay. very controversial. Right. I just want to let you, so you're going to tie the PPP loan and government all the way back to the education secretary? Well, so part of the CARES Act law, I think this was in the CARES Act, might have been in the one before it. Um, the legislation suspended wage garnishments and other involuntary collections on federal student loans until September 30th. But the education department or Department of Education has been garnishing people's uh, stimulus payments to pay their federal student loans despite that. And now there's a class action lawsuit against Betsy DeVos for illegally seizing millions of dollars in tax refunds. One of the plaintiffs, Corey Cole, a graduate of Heritage College in Lakeside, Colorado, said she received a treasury notice in April saying her and her husband's entire $7,000 federal tax refund was seized. Oh, so this was not the stimulus payments. This is tax refunds. But the legislation 
related to those stimulus payments also suspended wage garnishments and in other involuntary collections on federal student loans. Well, they've been having problems with the federal student loans and the educational department. They say they had breaks for teachers put in that. And I think this oh, yeah, goes yeah. back to like 08, 09, breaks for teachers. And then they they basically pulled back on it and just said, sorry, no, you got to pay your loans now. And even though these people went and got a degree to become a teacher. And like, yeah, so nope. they've had messes and it's been going on for a while with that. It's, I don't know. Um, so I don't know what else, what else there's a, well, I, I wanted to point people to a really great resource that I've been using over the last few weeks. Uh, my old firm, Armanino, they do a ton of business intelligence. They have a whole, um, consulting arm, uh, around business intelligence and setting up people on like power BI and on all that stuff. And, uh, one of the cool marketing slash, uh, helpful things that they have done is create a COVID recovery tracker. You can access this. The link will be in the show notes. And it is uh, like this really cool dashboard where you can see state by state the three-day moving average, seven-day moving average, and 14-day moving average of cases in each state. And you can drill down to the county level, which is really hard. It's hard to find data that's consolidated at a county level. So if I, for instance, can go to Arizona and then I can view counties and I can click specifically down into Maricopa County where I am right now. And I can see that the seven day versus 14 day moving average is up 1.4% as of today. This is for actually COVID cases. Is COVID is cases, cases, confirmed numbers, cases. Yeah. yeah. So, and of course, cases are not necessarily the perfect measure of what's going on because cases might go up because they're just testing more. Uh, you never, you know, it's hard to know. That's at least the argument of Maricopa County right now. Uh, it would be great if they also had hospitalizations, but just even this at a, at a county level is really interesting to see. I don't, I don't want to turn this to talking about uh, COVID, like the way it spread, et cetera. But I think the data, and as you drill down to those county levels, I saw, I heard a stat this week about how in the Midwest, if if a county has a meatpacking facility, their numbers are 5X higher than a county that doesn't. Because people are crammed together in a production lines. It's cold. It's cold, dry air close together. And it's repeated. And so, but the thing interesting is now that we're seeing like deeper data per county and deeper data per like, oh, all the people that were on this city bus, the people that sat by windows that were open, they didn't get it. So data is really coming out very accurate about COVID now, which means we're getting understandings, right? Um, who knows what it's going to change and move forward, but we're getting much better data and uh, much better understanding of it going forward. But you were going to talk about some PPP fraud? Yeah. So there's more PPP insanity. So uh, there's fraud. So last week we talked about the guy who set up some fake businesses. So now we have a Washington man. He um, He's a 35-year-old Washington state resident. Uh, Bill Zhang, he's a software engineer. He tried to do this crime multiple times, so obviously he got caught. Uh, one of those instances, he asked for a sum of $1.5 million for, for a PPP loan. He, he created a fictitious technology company and fictitious employees. And here's the, the genius part, or not genius part. He applied and got a real EIN number a week before, then used that e, attempted to use that EIN number to get the loan. That's kind of a giveaway there. Because <laughs> that tells me you probably didn't have any employees prior to getting this and so it's just, yeah. I mean, they're catching the people that are really doing blatant frauds, right? Right. There's always going to be some they won't catch, but it feels like you know the the frauds are getting caught. But there's also just brain farts going on. Did you see Bank of America notified their customers of a pen, potential data breach because of PPP applications? I saw something about that. Yeah. So what happened? So there? essentially, Bank of America and some other. Lenders, it doesn't say who they were, they had access to, uh, this is in quotes, limited access controlled small business administration test application pro platform. So there's some platform they were testing and you could upload some applications to. So apparently, they were uploading real applications to this, even though it was a test platform. And other lenders for limited amount of time, other lenders that were in this test program could see the applications of that were being submitted by the other lenders. But the fact that like, that they weren't just making up fake loans to test this test environment is bizarro to me. That's just lazy. Yeah. At least it was only other lenders who could see this, right? Yes. So, um, At least well, they say I, that, right? They're insisting that. So my story isn't about fraud, but it's about uh, creative accounting in public companies related to COVID-19. There's a new non-GAAP metric that is gaining popularity. David, are you familiar with the term EBITDA? 
please, please, please redefine for me. Earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. And this, this is, is what a, we work added like three extra letters to that, right? They created their own right. version of this. So EBITDA is a classic non-GAAP measure because it shows uh, – it, it backs out the interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization from your bottom line. Investors want to see, you know, operationally, are you making money or not? It's kind of a well-accepted non-GAAP measure. Well, uh, you know, like you said, other companies like WeWork have adjusted EBITDA <laughs> – and have pulled out things like, um, you know, their marketing expenditures and stuff like that, which is just, you know, most people would say that's not, that's not appropriate. Well, there's a new term, we're calling it EBITDAC. So it's earnings before interest taxes, depreciation, amortization, and coronavirus. And uh, I, I heard rumors about this starting to happen in Europe a couple weeks ago, and now it has hit reports of public companies in the United States, specifically Uber. Uber is now reporting uh, non-GAAP metric. They report adjusted EBITDA. And in March, Uber made further adjustments to both of uh, their adjusted EBITDA metrics to pull out $19 million or add back $19 million of, quote, payments for financial assistance to drivers personally impacted by COVID-19. So it increased adjusted EBITDA by $24 million to remove those relief payments to drivers, along with the costs of personal protective equipment given to drivers. So EBITDA is a real thing. And this is just going to see more of this. As you said, you, you saw this coming out of Europe. I guess it, it may be appropriate if coronavirus is a short-term thing that's only going to last one quarter. But we all know that I think most of us realize that it's going to take longer than that now, right? A survey of CFOs done by Deloitte called CFO Signals. This is an ongoing survey that they do. Finds that CFOs don't don't expect that near normal operating levels will resume until next year. Specifically, can't even see. I got to enlarge this. I can't see it. Yeah. So back in April, more many more CFOs were expecting that near normal operations would resume in 2020, and now only six percent of CFOs think that normal operations will resume in Q3. 16% think that it will resume in Q4. 21% think that normal operations will resume in Q1 of 2021. And a full 39% feel that normal operations will not resume until the second quarter of 2021 or later. So majority of CFOs think it'll be either Q1 or Q2 or, or even later than that. So your point of view on this then is the because this is really just going to be ongoing, it doesn't make sense to call it out separately anymore. It's just it's just, it's something that every single person is basically every business is affected by this. Like it doesn't yeah. be it's not anything special to an individual business. Yeah, so it's misleading to try and pull that out because they're probably gonna be spending that money for at least a year. So anyway, um one of the regulators in Europe was warning companies about using this metric. And I think we'll see probably some of that happening here in the United States. Sandy Peters is the head of the CFA Institute in New York. And she said, quote, people will get creative telling their story and our message is to be cautious of the creativity. This episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast is sponsored by Bill.com. Through these uncertain times, one thing has become clear. Accounting firms are in a unique and trusted position to help their clients adapt. For your firm, that means leaning into the services your clients have always depended on and more. And for your clients, it means helping them move quickly to a remote model and bringing key financial processes like accounts payable online smoothly. Using Bill.com, the intelligent business payments platform, accounting firms can take a client's time-consuming manual AP process and transform it completely with automation, tracking, mobility, and transparency, easing your client's shift to working remotely and setting the stage for strategic conversations about how your firm can help them navigate the new normal. To learn more about how Bill.com can help your firm automate AP and offer client advisory services, head over to cloudaccountingpodcast.promo slash bill. That is cloudaccountingpodcast.promo forward slash B-I-L-L. Bill.com, the intelligent business payments platform. Uh, what do you want to talk about next? I have... I have one small piece of app news that you'd be very excited about if you want to jump over there. 
Well, I do have, um, I've got one more coronavirus story. And this is a positive story. It's, and it's a, it's a great case study and maybe will offer our listeners some ideas for how to succeed. This is a story that uh, appeared in, a, in Accounting Today. It's not bad by Gail Crossley, who is one of the accounting top 100 people and uh, runs a firm, Crossley & Company. The article is called Pathways to Growth, Press Shift and Prepare to Pivot. And it's basically a case study of this firm, Grassy & Co., led by Lou Grassy, which opened in Long Island in the 1980s, started with just one person and is now a top 70 firm. And they experienced tremendous growth during the Great Recession. And Gail details exactly what Lou Grassi did to grow his practice with an offensive strategy during the Great Recession. So what he did was aggressively move to help clients with cash flow, accounts receivable, and figure out how to bring in bankers to get them involved in client turnarounds, and then convince the bankers to stop worrying about audited financials for his clients and focus on projections. And the firm got really deep into providing clients with detailed financial forecasting, which then they would also get the bankers involved in. So that helped the bankers get comfortable with providing financing. Clients got financing, were able to survive. They offered deferred payment to clients. We talked about this idea of deferred payment rather than doing the work for free, right? Yep. Because a third of firms are giving away coronavirus work for free right now, which I think is nuts. So this is brilliant. The Grassy firm offered deferred payment to clients, but on one condition, they had to agree to contacting one or more friends or associates and letting them know how Grassy was meeting their needs. And this was a giant lead generation funnel. Okay. So they're getting their existing clients to bring in more clients in exchange for deferred payment. And the firm grew 15% from 2008 to 2009. And that has been the normal amount of growth ever since. So that's so that way that, that the work you're giving away for free is now genuinely a marketing expense because you're rec- in order to give yes. that work away for free, you're basically doing a barter and saying, hey, you need to refer me one client. And they weren't even giving it away for free. They're just deferring payment until the economy improves, right? Which could be a while, granted. But that was a, yeah, a huge marketing tool for them. And I, I really like the bit about financial forecasting. One other thing they did was they they used these forecasts to internally rank risk for clients. So they had a way to see all their clients and figure out which ones were in the most trouble and then triage those needing the most assistance. And this is a, a great quote from the story. Lou recalls talking with one distraught business owner who was not a grassy client, but who was concerned about his company's future in 2008. When Lou asked what his current firm advised, the owner responded, I don't know. I haven't heard from them. That told Lou everything he needed to know about the need to be present and solution-driven. The business switched to Grassy and remains a loyal client. And that makes me think of that other stat that we talked about in a previous episode about how many firms have not even reached out to their clients to talk about COVID-19 or talk about the coronavirus situation. So a huge opportunity right, to, to talk to all these folks who are not getting helped, and then convert them into your clients. So these examples are techniques this uh, firm used during the 2008 crisis. Mm-hmm. So I have an article from Jason Stats. It's Stats with two A's. Um, he's a J Stats CPA on Twitter. So he caught my eye about two weeks ago because he was creating automatically creating a PPP forgiveness report by using Airtable, and he automated some some data and movement. And he caught my eye on Twitter. He's just talking about it. Anyways, he wound up writing a blog post uh, called How We Pre-Build 100% of Our PPP Work and Still Sleep at Night. And he really gives like an outline and a template on a way for firms to handle this billing for PPP because we talked about last week. You know, you're not getting the agency fee. What do you do? Um, And really break it down into three things. You need to create a product. So you have to take your service and make it become a product, a sales channel. And you need a way to drive clients to the sales channel. And so he has this nice little outline of like, you know, you have to create a calculator or this report could be the delivery, right? It could be a delivery phone call, right? You just have to take your service and turn it into a product. Um, and they talks about, you know, a sales channel. Is it a sign up link on your website, a single page landing page? And he gets into specifics, some tools he's used to build this out. And then he even gets into very advanced tactics with like using practice ignition combined with Zapier right? And some templates, uh, doing mass emails and then, you know, drive them to your sales channel, do a webinar, a mass email. But then the nice thing is he gets into a little bit about the fears, um, and answers questions. You know, I feel bad for billing for anything. I'm a 
afraid I'll overcommit myself. I don't have confidence or my technical skills to do a webinar. Um, what will I do if they extend the PPP? What about agent fees? So he really uh, gives a little bit of a template on how to handle this and then really how to overcome those fears. So that'll be in the show notes. It's worth checking out. It's a good article. Well, we've talked about layoffs. And one of the big four is now formally doing mass layoffs. Deloitte has announced that they are going to lay off 5% of their staff firm-wide. And 1.5 of the workforce is either going to get furloughed or have their work hours reduced with reduced pay. So 6.5% layoffs plus furloughs. So that's about 5,000 people at Deloitte that are going to uh, lose their jobs or have their hours cut back. And that fits with the layoffs that I've seen um, percentage-wise, you know, in in surveys of the profession. Um, So, you know, we're not hurting as much as some places, right, where um, what national unemployment is, last time I checked, 15%. uh, And in California, it's like 25%. So accounting is doing much better than everywhere else. But, you know, I would expect during the Great Recession, unemployment and accounting was, uh, you know, there were, I think, 10% of people lost their jobs. So I would not be surprised if if we lost 10% of jobs in the end during this crisis. I mean, I've talked to some firms that are from that firm size 50 to 200, and then even smaller firms. And I have not gotten any vibe that they've laid off anybody. It's really just like the big, gigantic firms. And, and you said they, they laid off 5% of their staff, right? Deloitte just right. announced. So I'm guessing they probably have 20% of bloat at Deloitte. So they probably can still get the same amount of work done with 95% of the staff they had before. But but I'm not seeing a lot of smaller firms. I actually, to, I'm seeing the opposite. I'm th- I'm seeing as this firm, the smaller the firm is, I'm seeing people hire. I'm seeing accounting and bookkeeping firms post ads and hire during this time. Well, you know why? Because you're talking to cloud firms that are well positioned to grow oh, during the crisis. Good point. And why? because they have already figured out remote work. Here's something interesting that may actually relate to that uh, Deloitte layoffs figure. You said that Deloitte can lay off people because they'll just make their current people work harder. Well, they may not even have to make them work harder because apparently people who work from home, professionals who have started working from home that used to work in the office are working more hours. 54% of People at accounting firms say that they are working more hours since quarantine started, and it's because they're working at home, and there's no division between being at the office and being at home now. This is a survey from Fishbowl that was reported in Going Concern. They surveyed 16,000 professionals across a variety of industries. I'm just talking about the um, accounting data. Over half, 54%, are working more hours since quarantine started because they're working at home. And you wonder, though, are people okay with that? Would they prefer to go back to the office or would they like to stay home? Do you have a guess on this, David? Um, is it divided between people who have kids at home versus people that don't <laughs> have kids at home? It doesn't divide that way. But 59% said yes, they would work home, work from home permanently if their firm allowed it. So even though people are, you know, half of people are working more hours, almost 60% would continue to work from home permanently if their firm allowed it. The amount they're working extra is something like one to 10 hours per week extra, which makes actually a lot of sense because that's kind of the amount of time a lot of people are commuting every day. Instead of commuting, you're just logging on and starting work right away. So it proves that whole idea that remote work is more productive. I I think we're going to see a noticeable difference in people in these surveys come fall when schools reopen and kids go back to school because you're going to be working from home. You're already a little bit more productive than you were working in the office. And by the time fall gets here, you're going to be a lot better at working from home. And now you take out this like, and like use it is a weight, right? You're having your kids at home and you're trying to work at home is a weight. And, oh, it's and, and, so hard. And so now you take all these people working from home and you you just cut that weight. How productive yeah. are people going to be? And tech is leading the way. Twitter told employees back in May that they could work from home permanently. Facebook has announced that they're going to shift things so that over the next decade, half of its 45,000 employees will be able to work from home all the time. Shopify is going to let most employees work remotely in the future. LinkedIn in the past month has seen a 28% increase in remote job postings and a 42% increase in searches for remote or work from home. And that's according to the Wall Street Journal. 
uh, an article called For Many, Remote Work is Becoming Permanent in Wake of Coronavirus. And I can see this. I mean, even look, let's take something very inside baseball here, right? I'm here in Tucson, Arizona. Intuit has their big, huge call center here. They, they do all the mm-hmm. accountant support, but it's closed. Essentially, this call center is closed and everybody's working from home. And I haven't heard any – Intuit just keeps chugging along. I haven't heard any rumors or rumblings of, oh, people can't get the support they want. I've not heard accountants complaining support has dropped or the level of support I get. Um, any complaints against Intuit about this? So, mm-hmm. you're right. Like People are going to question – but do you need a building? Do you need desks? Can you have people work at home? I mean, it, it's pretty clear that it hasn't impacted things drastically as much as people maybe thought in the last decade fighting the idea of working from home. And there's a big question too as to what this means for big cities. Are people going to flee the big cities? Uh, we don't really have a lot of data showing that people are moving yet, but that could be because a lot of people aren't selling their homes. There's been uh, just a a real shrinkage in the inventory on the market in homes, because think about it, you're selling a home, you don't necessarily want a bunch of people with COVID-19 walking through your house, doing open houses. You may be uncertain about your own job situation. So maybe better not to mix things up. So there's very low inventory, but there's also a ton of demand. People want to get out of their apartments. They want to buy houses. If you can work from home, maybe you want a home office. That's exactly the situation that I'm in right now, and uh, with my wife, because we're 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 buying a home here in in Scottsdale, and we decided that we would each get our own office, and we can afford to do it moving from LA. <laughs> but you know, for the price of a three bedroom apartment, actually less than our monthly payment on a three bedroom apartment in LA, we can get a five bedroom home in Arizona. So, like, I think a lot of people are going to do this, and it's going to be interesting. Like, what's 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 going to happen to those cities? Are you know? But prices aren't dropping, right? Home prices are not dropping, which is unusual in a recession. Well, if you combine that might continue. If you combine that trend, the worker home trend, with the when the the Trump tax cuts originally, what is that, three years ago came out? And one of the major things with the tax cuts were the um, home interest deductions. And so basically they was punishing people on the coast that had homes that were a million dollars. Yeah. Because you you were you were limited on how much you could claim and they lowered that down. But if you move to another part of the country or you moved out to the suburbs where homes are a little bit cheaper, yep. you got to take advantage. Of, you could still take advantage of that tax credit. And so you combine tax policy, which is affecting social policy of where people live, combine it with the work from home. Absolutely. There's probably going to be a rush to the suburbs. Not to mention, I think just if they're in lockdown. Um, I, I know people in New York, you, there's not a lot of places you can go. You know, if, if no, you have your house, it's not very fun. If you're in the suburbs, you can at least go out to your patio. You can go outside yeah. and nobody's around you. You can still socially distance, but be have some elbow room, right? And so I could see. Yep. So yeah, I think you're right on, on that and, and where that heads. Now there are two issues with leaving the city. One is internet access. We have really terrible broadband internet access in rural America by global standards. It's actually pretty darn bad, and a lot of times it's because we have you know one provider that has a monopoly over that area like Comcast or whatever. And there's like virtually no incentive for them to upgrade to fiber optic in a city of 50,000 people because they've already got the market and the people are paying for it. And so why would I as a cable company invest to improve service when I'm not going to be able to charge that much more? Because you would get a tax break, tax policy (laughs) could affect that. Maybe. Well, but they've been pursuing the uh, opposite strategy. And I I just listened to a, a planet money episode called small America versus big internet on, uh, uh, Oh, that's a good episode. I listened to that. It was a good one. Yeah. So it's about a a town. I forget the name of the town in North Carolina, I believe about 50,000 people that decided to build its own fiber optic internet because they couldn't convince the cable company to do it. And then, uh, the way that the cable companies responded was to lobby the state legislature to pass a law to prevent local governments from building their own fiber optic networks and creating a utility essentially out of internet access. So that's going to be a big challenge. Um, This one city was able to get an exemption. So they still have and operate their own, you know, gigabit ethernet service, which is very successful and has actually made the city kind of an oasis, a place you can move and live in a small town. Well, it's a small city, 50,000 people, and still, you know, have uh, the ability to get high-speed internet. But yeah, like that's preventing a lot of the movement out, I think. 
Um, and we have to figure out how to overcome that. But if people move to work remote, that's going to create additional demand, which maybe right. companies will invest in the infrastructure once the, once the demand's there. Yeah. And there's something like two dozen, maybe 20 states that have passed these laws. So maybe that you know will get undone as a result of that, the pressure. The other problem with people working from home, which is happening right now, especially in places where people live in one state and work in another one, like in the New York area, is the state tax nexus problem of people working from home. Like all these states on the East Coast, you know, like New Jersey, New York, Connecticut have reciprocal arrangements or they, they've worked out deals where people only have to pay taxes in the in one state. If if you live in New Jersey but you work in New York, you know, you pay your taxes in New York or you pay it where you live. I don't remember how exactly it works, but that way you don't have to file two state tax returns. But the problem right now is you've got people who normally work in New York who now are working uh, in New Jersey at their house or in Connecticut at their house, but the company has an office in New York and that's where it's it's headquartered. Or, you know, my situation, right? Like uh, my company is headquartered in California. I was living there, but now I'm in Arizona. So we had to change my tax residency. And, you know, I don't know what that's going to do for the company. So it's creating lots of issues for uh, both companies and potentially employees. Well, well, I can tell you right now, because my wife has a rental house in California. And just because of that, we have to file a California return every single year. And California wants to know how many days we visited the state of California and they just did off of that. So you're going to have fun wow. to do your taxes in the state of California on this because you're right. <laughs> States don't have any type of agreement. So, so it's a, a land grab of getting every dollar and squeezing you for every minute you spent in that state. And so you're going to, you're going to have fun doing your taxes with California this year. Um, <laughs> well, and, 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 you know, that's a pain, right? The state tax nexus, the uh, internet access, but you know, what is really nice, David, is the ability to not wear pants while you're working. <laughs> and we actually have data on this. Thank you to Going Concern for reporting another fishbowl survey. Apparently, one in 10 professionals are video conferencing in their underwear. Have you ever done this? Have you ever been guilty of it? No, I just... I think it's true. I, I, I just... Whatever I'm wearing, I, I don't even care. I just show up. No brushing teeth. No comb in the hair. I just get on the call. So apparently men are three times more likely than women to report going pantsless on Zoom with men coming in at 14% uh, versus 5% for women. 3% though are still putting on a suit to video chat. That is kind of crazy. 75% uh, of respondents are putting on some kind of pants, even if those are PJs. Half of women responded that they have stopped wearing makeup completely, uh, where on the men's side, about 30% have given up shaving. So, so just so I'm, I'm hearing these numbers correctly. So I'm on a Zoom call <laughs> and there's there's seven men in this one Zoom call. One of those seven will not be wearing pants? Is this is this the stat? <laughs> on on average, yes. <laughs> on average. Wow. So every Zoom call you're in, somebody's not wearing pants, basically, if it's a group chat or a group call. Potentially. potentially Amazing. Yeah. I, I'm yeah. like, well, and then if, since that's the average, that means sometimes you're in a meeting and like six of the seven may not be wearing pants. <laughs> And and actually, you know, what's more likely is that at least, you know, if you're on a call with 10 people, about four of them have started drinking already because 42% of employees say they drink while working from home, according to uh, another fishbowl survey as reported in Going Concern. Well, if you're in, if you use a Zoom background, you keep the drink for further enough back, it goes behind the virtual background and nobody can see your drink. Right. Nobody can see your drink. So, so I have some exciting uh, app news for you, Blake. <laughs> Super exciting app news. All right. And, and, and it's just for you, ultimately. Let's. Let's do it. So, so remember, I don't know, like two years ago, you got your little Apple credit card. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, that was actually that was actually just last okay. year. Okay. And you're so excited about your Apple credit card and how slick it is, and it works with your phone and all this stuff. And then you were like, "Oh, no, no, I." I I, I wasn't excited about it. I just like the discount, the 3% off discount. on the Apple products. And then yeah. you started to get in there and you were disappointed <laughs> because it didn't connect to Mint or Quicken or QuickBooks. You were disappointed that the data was just locked up. Yeah. Yes, that is that is just ridiculous. So, Like there's no statements. A Apple quietly – so this was an, on a, a website called Appleosophy. So think like philosophy but – put the word Apple in the middle of the word. So this article <laughs> uh -huh. came out, the new iOS 13.5, they snuck in a little feature. If you have the Apple credit card, it now can export to Quicken Financial Exchange, the QFX file, and a QuickBooks QBO file. So there's no bank feed integration yet. Hey. But you can manually download the two file types. And 
the best part of this article is the artwork that uh, this person went and selected. It's essentially the Quicken logo, which includes Nemo anymore, right? The Quicken logo mm-hmm. from 12 years ago and the QuickBooks <laughs> logo from 12 years ago. So congratulations, oh, no. Apple. In 2020, halfway through 2020, you basically now support the file formats of QuickBooks and Quicken from a decade plus ago. Like bank, we're in the world of bank feeds and they're just now adding this to their credit card feed. So, That's great. Uh, I thought that was interesting. Uh, I have to do one other thing I, I, about the AICPA if you want to jump to that. but I, I have some app news. Okay. So now you can set up and manage time off in T-Sheets. I guess they did not have this feature before. Let me dig into the article and see how this works. Really? <laughs> yes. Okay. So now account administrators can set up time off codes and accruals. Admins and managers can enter time off in bulk. Admins and managers can approve or deny team members time off requests. And depending on the account settings, team members can enter time off or they can request time off. In both options, team members will see the number of hours they are predicted to have on the date for the time off. And that's actually a really neat feature that you don't see in every single time tracking app or a time sheets app is the ability to predict time off in the future. Because a lot of times you have to schedule this stuff months out. Yeah. And I, I'm still surprised, like, as you think about, you know, into its payroll products, right? And they're now offering, uh, you know, the ability to get uh, health insurance to that. And they do offer a little bit of workers' comp situation through there, right? That mm-hmm. T sheets just isn't rolled in as part of that as a big, what do you call those, uh, big employer uh, benefits? PEOs. PEOs, right? Yeah. yeah. Like th- that, that, where basically it's, it's payroll and everything else you need for your employee relationship. Cause Intuit kind of has it in a bunch of pieces, but it's like you have to subscribe to everything separately. It's very disjointed. And like, I'm surprised they haven't pulled this together into one package where you get all this functionality, like time off requests and holidays and insurance and all the benefits stuff all rolled together into one complete package. Cause I think they even are work with, um, uh, guideline 401k, you can get 401k now mm-hmm. through it. So it, it's very disjointed though. I'm surprised it's not all rolled together. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they eventually come up with a per-employee, all-inclusive type deal. That seems like it would be appealing. Uh, I got one other app update for you. This is a fundraising round from something I've never heard about. It's an app called Stackin. S-T-A-C-K-I-N apostrophe. Stackin, like your stackin' bills. They have raised $12.6 million in a Series B to help millennials navigate the crowded fintech space. So this app... Apparently, it helps you via text message learn how to handle your money by helping you figure out what apps to use. Should you use Robinhood, Stash, Public, Acorns, or Truebill? You know, how do you save money? How much should you save? What kind of 401k should you set up? And they do this all via text messaging. And they find people, they find customers advertising on platforms like TikTok, Snapchat, and Instagram. This TechCrunch article that I'm reading says to think of Stackin as a more friendly and less nerdy robo-advisor that sends you advice on how to save and from time to time recommends an app that you might enjoy in the fintech space. So so basically it's like nerd wallet, but via text messages. Nerd wallet for millennials and Gen Zers. Yeah. Hmm. All right, it'd be an interesting one to watch. So it's kind of amazing to me that a you know, they're, they're basically just a text messaging advisor that refers you to other apps, has raised $12.6 million in a Series B to basically just do that. They don't have their own investment platform or anything. And they well, don't it's, even it's have their own model. platform. It's an advertising model. They're just right. providing a service for these fintech companies that are now taking gigantic rounds. They need to spend that right. money on advertising, so they're going to get their piece of the – yeah, that. that the startup site so they just keeps stack going. In. Yeah, they yeah. pay Stackin, and and Stackin's paying Facebook and uh, TikTok yeah. and all the other platforms advertising. It's just it's that startup cycle. This money, it's kind of right. The the ecosystem. So so Stackin to give you some numbers, put some numbers on this. Stackin had added one million active users in a little over a year, and it has sent more than one hundred million text messages to date. And and they don't even have their own text messaging platform. They're built on top of Twilio. So they actually spend most of their money paying Twilio and they're not yet profitable. So you've got like the flow of money is Robinhood wants to get users. So they pay Stackin to advertise to Stackin's eyeballs. And then Stackin pays Twilio to send all those 100 million text messages. It's it's bizarre the, the way this... Some of the stuff but I'm amazed that like... Yeah, I'm amazed that uh, you know TikTok is a way to acquire 
you know, customers for your fintech app. That's pretty cool. I, I'm still not on fi- uh, TikTok, and I, I feel like I'm getting old. You know, I'm falling behind. I gotta figure this out. I created an account. I have not put any videos on, and I've watched. Like, I'm starting to get it a little bit, but you know, I was thinking we could do something kind of interesting. Like, we could record a clip of the show and put it on there, and then people could remix and do crazy things <laughs> with our voice. I yes, don't know. The show should be on TikTok. It's, uh, I'm still trying to take it in, right? Uh, what it is. So <laughs> I'm just trying to, you know, relate to my kids here. Uh, but, and I have to relate to my kids because what I'm going to make them do this summer is going to make them hate me. So. What's that? So what, what are you going to make them do? So the AICPA offers free online accounting learning tools for high school students. Oh, all right. So the AICPA has released several free online educational resources for teachers, parents, and others to use to educate students about accounting and personal finance basics. So one of the games, Blake, this sounds like fun. I mean, I cannot wait to tell my kids about this. It's called Bank on It, right? It challenges Bank what? Bank on It. Bank, bank on it. On it. It's, okay. It challenges students' knowledge of accounting principles and personal finance planning with real world, real working world scenarios. So, Blake, if, if you know, you, you're my kid, I'm like, hey, Blake, why don't you go on and do this online quiz? This, it's, it's a challenge. I challenge you to take some time away from Fortnite and do this, Blake. What is the acceptable amount of questions you would accept in this quiz? Uh, like 10. <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe let's say this. When you got your CPA and you took all the CPA exams, uh-huh. how many questions were in, on those quizzes? Oh, I, I've erased that from my memory. I have. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Uh, hundreds. Hundreds. Okay. Yeah. This game features yeah. more than 2,200 questions. Oh, boy. Your kids are going to love you, David. <laughs> 2,200 questions in a quiz geared towards yeah. high school kids. <laughs> so, hey, everybody listening, in about a month when we record, you know, four or five episodes from now, uh, I fully expect David's children to have run away from home. Yeah. <laughs> so, if you know where they are, you know, let us know. He apologizes for making them take this AICPA course. But they don't have to run uh, away from home, Blake, because they can take an AICPA virtual field trip with tours with 14 CPAs across different industries to explore the roles. Like, where, wait, where do you go on your virtual field trip? You go to apparently a CPA office and, f- <laughs> and you explore their role to give you an inside scoop on what it's like to be an accountant. This is a course that you can take on the uh, AICPA site? It's a, a virtual field trip. It's actually called Virtual Field Trips. Wow. So, yeah, I mean, we'll see how this goes. A fiel- I'm going to have my a, kids do this. A field trip to an accounting firm is pretty great, but when you make it virtual, I, I would, I, I don't know, your kids must be so excited. Like, have you broken the news to them yet? No, I have not. I've not told them about oh, okay. this yet. Uh, you should record that for TikTok. <laughs> That would be good. The reaction. Hey, kids, guess what you're doing all summer? Here's what you're doing for summer school. It's, it's a tour every yeah. week. You get to go on a tour with another accountant. So, are, are, Do your kids – like I have, I have a question because my, my son's five and like he doesn't really understand what I do. And he knows that I do a podcast and he has to go in his room and be quiet and he's really good about that. But like uh, what, what, what do your kids think about like what you do for a living? At some level, it's not conceptual because it's all on the computer, right? And mm-hmm. so they are very much, you just sit on your computer all day, dad, which justifies them sitting on an Xbox, right? They, they almost like right, they don't, they don't equate right. it to, you know, a, a, as a business. But um, I have made them do some work, you know, when they've been out of school. I made them update some records in Salesforce, which is just drudgery, right? I've had my daughter do that. Um, I, sh- I introduced them to Excel and Google Sheets and like they made a formula and think data just updated, blew their minds. Right. So they're tiptoeing in the waters. And now my daughter's actually started to understand like the concept of what QuickBooks is for. Right. Before they didn't really get it. Right. But they're starting to, yeah, they're starting to tiptoe in the waters here. Um, I have to be careful. I don't want to turn them off to the industry. Right. 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 But they're starting to uh, tiptoe in the waters right. here with this stuff. Well, that's good. I think the spreadsheet skills is awesome. Really important for anyone. Well, I think that's, uh, that's about it. Right, David? I don't think I have anything else other than, uh, Make sure you tell your clients if they can't find their check, it might come as a debit card, but it's not a fake debit card. You know, you get that junk mail in the junk mail that has the fake looking credit cards. Apparently, the stimulus checks look like a fake looking credit card and people are throwing them away. Be careful. <laughs> Don't throw away your stimulus money. If you want to give us a call and let us know what you think about anything we've talked about on the show, call us at 202 695 1040. 
That is 202-695-1040. It's a Google Voice mailbox. goes straight to voicemail. You can leave a message. We'll take a listen, and maybe we'll even play it on the air. You're also welcome to get in touch with me on Twitter. I'm at Blake T. Oliver. And how about you, David? I'm at David Leary on Twitter and at David Leary on LinkedIn. And I don't know. I'm something the David Leary, I think, on uh, TikTok. All right. Uh, well, now I'm going to have to set up an account so that we can figure out how to do this. Because uh, if we can get like Laurel and Wilson to, um, you know, we, we need somebody to do that like Donald Trump thing where the comedians like uh, lip sync to us. That's exactly that it, right? Be, like people can, we, we yeah, can put yeah. a recording of the podcast, a snippet, and then people can pretend they're us. I don't know. It's going to be bad. There's nothing good that can come out of this. Uh, well, David, until next week. You know, have a have a great rest of your Sunday, and um, you know, let's let's hope that the country doesn't burn down between now and uh, the ne- the next time we record. And you know, hopefully, in the end, things change for the better. Yeah, hugs and be safe, everybody. It's uh, yeah. we're, it'll be interesting. Yeah, you're right to see where we are seven days from now on this. Talk to you later. Right, bye. Time for the classifieds. Did you know that in response to the COVID-19 situation that you can now take your Microsoft Excel certification from home? Want to learn how? You can by joining Steve Chase's Excel Bootcamp. His summer classes run Monday through Fridays from 3 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. Central Time. Register online at sequentiasolutions.com slash bootcamp. For only $150, if you mention the Cloud Accounting Podcast referred to you, you'll receive an extra $30 off. High school students are highly encouraged to sign up and you can find the link in the show notes. AccountingTax.com has helped more than 8,900 tax accounting and wealth management firms map out a client experience through client acquisition, conversion, onboarding, retention, and expansion with the goal of getting clients to pay more year over year. If you're looking to develop your practice and take it to the next level with advisory services, go to AccountingTax.com forward slash cloud to learn more. Still sending spreadsheets of unclassified expenses to clients? Automate this process and get client answers instantly with Client Hub's QuickBooks Online integration. This feature was described as one that only an accountant would have come up with, as it solves a real big pain point. Client Hub is a modern client portal designed for cloud accounting firms. Get started today with a free trial at clienthub.app and enter promo code CAP25 for 25% off your first three months. Stop spending endless hours creating and building workflow and process templates for your firm. Jetpack Workflow is 32 accounting flow workflow templates you can download for free. These popular accounting templates include monthly bookkeeping, weekly accounting analysis, and 990, 1120, 1041, 1040 tax returns. Download yours free today at jetpackworkflow.com slash free templates. That's jetpackworkflow.com slash free templates. Want to get the word out about your newsletter, webinar, party, Facebook group, podcast, ebook, job posting, or that fancy Excel macro you just created? Why not let the listeners of the Cloud Accounting Podcast know by running a classified ad? Hit the show notes for the link to get more info, and be sure to check out our special stimulus pricing of four episodes for just $100.